Thanks for having us. No problem. How y'all doing? Welcome to Chicago. Doing good. Doing good. good. Yeah. Good. So you both are twin brothers from Australia. Yep. Curious to know how you both got started in the filmmaking industry. Uh, we say we jumped the back fence into the film industry. Uh, we were in design for, for quite a while. We're motion graphics artists. Uh, dealt with a lot of post-production, visual effects, that kind of thing in the early 2000s. And around the same time as each other, around maybe six months from each other, we both jumped into directing live action at production companies for advertising, uh, commercials, that kind of thing. Started to do commercials, music videos, you know, a lot of live action stuff. And in about 2007, uh, we moved to the States together, to New York, knowing that LA might end up being further down the line. And so did a decade in New York doing mainly advertising, did spots for Google, you know, a bunch of things. And it wasn't until about 2014 that we just felt a little restricted with the shorter form uh, narrative stuff. 30 seconds, 60 seconds, sometimes 15 seconds. Yeah. And felt like we wanted to stretch our legs a little bit. And that's where Bagman, this short film that Kian is based on and inspired by, uh, came about. Great. And what kind of work did you guys do for Google now that you're here? Uh, a number of different things. There was some stuff for the phone originally, and then that got uh, canceled. There's like there was a bunch of different things with a few different agencies. You guys got money, so uh, yeah, you you guys make stuff and scrap stuff. All the time. <laughs> I'm sure you're aware of that. A little bit here and there. <laughs> a little. Um, and as brothers who have created a number of short films and just like commercial spots together, um, how do you guys merge your ideas and influences together? I feel like brothers get on each other's tails. Yeah, <laughs> look, yeah, it does for us as well. I mean, a, a lot of people say, I could never direct with my brother or sister. And yeah, some people are like that. We're the type of twins that have grown up liking the same stuff, having the same taste. Yeah. Uh, generally, we've, we're in high school together, college together. We're in a brief stint in the Army Reserves together. We've done a whole range of stuff. So it just makes sense that we have the same taste. Yeah, no, it works. It works well, I think. Going into high stress environments, uh, this isn't necessarily one of them. It's a bit casual, uh, but you know, you're in a boardroom with studio executives or whatever, and you're pitching a movie. You want your bro there to kind of back you up, and it's nice to have someone to, you know, take over, and you have a second to think for a minute. And yeah, no, it works really well. Mm. That's great. And when you guys were looking into potential careers, how did you guys come up with filmmaking? Did you guys? have a moment in your earlier years that you thought filmmaking is the career for me? Yeah. We've always been obsessed with movies. I'm sure you know millions of people are. But I guess back in the 90s, whenever we could get our hands on a camera, uh, we would, you know, from high school, all that type of stuff. And we started making our own thing. Usually, we were emulating stuff. So it was like watching trailers and then making our own backyard version of trailers and all that kind of junk. <laughs> Uh, um, early on as well, we had a, a fascination with putting visuals to music, and that led quite easily into music videos. Totally. And just like creating emotions with very simple stories. Um, a lot of the time with no dialogue, which Bagman became uh, the lead character in the short, which you can check out online. Um, it doesn't say a word in the entire film. Right. And so carrying over that very simple aesthetic of minimalism and quietness into a studio feature film was interesting because okay. you know your lead character needs to say some stuff at times. Great. And speaking of which, tell us a little bit more about Ken, uh, the trailer we just saw. Yeah. Well, look, it's, a, it's the last movie of the summer. So uh, we're transitioning into movies that are maybe a little, hopefully, smarter. Uh, awards fair, things like that. Um, I think this movie has a taste of both. It's, it's got some big sci-fi concept stuff in it, um, as you can see from the trailer. Uh, but it's not your traditional sci-fi. It's also got um, a much more of an influence with character and a story about brothers. We, we figured out pretty quickly when we wanted to turn Bagman into a longer form project that uh, we really needed to dive deeper. And so we didn't want to be handcuffed by the things that were in the short necessarily. So we, were f we felt like we were free to change certain things and adapt certain things. 
And so we figured out it's about family and then specifically about a very unconventional brother unit. And, and what does that look like? Like, are you only brothers if, if, if it's blood? Uh, is it circumstance and the things that you go through, trauma? Like, what brings brothers together? So that's really what the movie's about. Um, essentially, this kid finds a giant, crazy alien space rifle. And that does not belong in this movie, but that's the challenge, to try to make it all feel as grounded and realistic as possible. Yeah, the other half of that sort of genre tone uh, with the sci-fi is a much more sort of indie-spirited you know, character drama. Uh, there is elements of, of crime stuff in there, there's a uh, coming of age road trip. It's really multiple things. And what turned us on is just things that are harder to define. You know, coming from advertising, it was very easy to get put in a box. And we early on became the visual effects guys. And you've got, you know, transforming cars and houses and rooms and, and in there fun stuff and they generally have big budgets. Um, but at the end of the day, we, we have influences from, you know, more modern, gritty crime dramas like yeah. out, of, out of the Furnace or, or Place Beyond the Pines or Mud or yeah. you know these more sort of quieter sophisticated sort of filmmaking and it's the partnership of those two with sci-fi that makes this really uh, unique. Mm -hmm. That's great and I know we saw James Franco in that film. Talk us yeah. a little bit more about the actor and actress selection, how you guys yeah. decided who goes in this film. Well you basically do a top five list for every role and you, there is months of discussion from our side of just who's right for it. One thing you definitely don't want to do is write the screenplay thinking of an actor. Horrible idea because you'll always disappoint yourself. But with this top five lists, you go through and, and you're like, okay, who are we going to go out to? And the casting process can be really frustrating because you've got to go one at a time. We're not auditioning. We're not bringing all these giant actors like Dennis Quaid into a room and getting him to do his lines. That's not the way it works. So you go out one by one to these people and you wait for them to say they're available or they're interested or whatever it may be. And we were really lucky to team up with 21 Laps, uh, the guys who made Stranger Things, uh, which wasn't made when we joined up with them. We just knew of this Netflix show they were doing on the side. Uh, so they do really good stuff, and they can easily get on a phone and say, James, uh, these, these are really good guys. They've got a great script. I know Have they haven't done a movie before. Yeah, tr trust, but trust me. <laughs> uh, watch this short film and get back to us. So uh, we were really lucky. Zoe was our number one, and we actually got her, which is kind of incredible. Uh, she has this sense of cool that you can't fake. Uh, and she, yeah, she's kind of perfect for the role. And then James came up uh, through Sean Levy, one of the producers. And we'd always liked the more sort of spring breakers side of, of his career. And, and he loves playing with darker characters that have a very sort of in your face charisma, uh, makes you uncomfortable, uh, makes you not know whether you need to laugh or sort of pull back in your seat. And he plays a character, a, a mullet wearing a Cosby sweater wearing uh, gun runner in this, and he's one of those characters that kind of is pretty terrifying, but also has some very comedic moments. It's fun. Yeah. Uh, the, the other, the, the two brothers, I mean, it's about them. Uh, the older guy is Jack Rayner, he's an Irish actor, has actually quite a dense Irish accent in, in real life. Um, he was in a bunch of indie Irish cinema um, movies like um, Glassland with uh, Tony Collette. What Richard did by Lenny Abramson, um, he was even in a giant Transformers movie, which um, I'm pretty sure he doesn't want to be in again. Uh, and so we Pay for his house, though. Yeah, probably. <laughs> we wanted someone that you might have seen before. He was in Sing Street, one, one of our favorite. He's a great character in Sing Street. Um, Sing Street fan. Yep, right here in the red. Uh, so we, we put someone in that lead role that you might know, but you're not like you really know. I think Jake Gyllenhaal in that role might, w mightn't have worked as well because you want to learn who these two brothers are without kind of being clouded by something. And then the lead kid, we auditioned heavily for this, and it was a very difficult role to find, someone who was insular and m emotionally mature and someone who could stand up in a room full of adults and feel like they belong and isn't trying to like sing and dance for you the entire time. And this is his first movie. Like oh, no we, yeah. we had nothing to go off other than an audition tape, a self tape from home on a phone. And uh, we just really were impressed with the fact that he didn't come out trying to impress us. He had the confidence to kind of pull back and be very subtle with it all. And yeah, he, he's, he's brilliant. It's his movie. That's awesome. 
And as you guys are working with these actors and actresses, how are you guys working with each other on set? Well, I think rule number one is we want to try to not uh, contradict each other. That's, that's, <laughs> that's not rule number one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the last thing you want is to be sitting at the monitor and you have an idea and you run up and you tell them something and then Josh has an idea and run up and says the exact opposite. I mean, right. that's nightmare material. Um, but yeah, we 50-50 we everything. We have the same taste, like Josh said, so we trust each other. There's, there's mutual respect there. And Great. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. And as we're coming up kind of on time here, um, What's next for you guys? What are you guys thinking about with your next move? Uh, we have a really killer science-based TV show that we're looking at right now. We're developing with the writer of Arrival, um, and it's going to be killer. You guys are actually going to really like it. Uh, hopefully, that's something that comes out on a premium channel at some point. We're pitching it out at the end of the year. And then just a couple of movies and, and different things. We, we certainly don't want to like I said before, get put, sort of put in a box. We like telling interesting stories and unique stories. Uh, this, we're just lucky that this first one is very personal to us and sure. came from something that we did as a short film. So mm. yeah, we're, we're really proud of it. I'm interested just as much to find out what's next. Um, the movie hasn't come out yet, so hopefully it changes things up. It's hard to know. That's great. And we want to open it up to Q&A from the audience. So if anyone has a question, feel free to walk up to the mic. Yeah, hi guys. What's, what's up, man? What's your name? Yeah, appreciate it. Nelson. What's up, Nelson? Um, first of all, I'm really excited because I love Carrie Coon. And it's oh, awesome. She's, she's, awesome. she's, she's great, man. Yeah. Um, also, Mogwai. So I think they did oh, the soundtrack great, for this. Great question. Yeah. Um, I know they've done a soundtrack for this French show that I really love. Yeah. How yeah. was it working and sort of the, the process of working with a band like Mogwai to yeah. sort of soundtrack? Well, look, we got Mogwai stories for days. They're, they're really, really cool. It's one of our favorite bands. Um, we knew at the very beginning that we wanted to go with a band on this and not a traditional composer, just to have a different life for, for the music so that it could go, come out on an album and, and have its own fan base. Let's be honest, it was a selfish endeavor. Yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> you want to hold a vinyl in your hand. Yeah, definitely. Is... And so we did a, a playlist that went for about 13 hours that, that was from Bagman, and then we transferred it over to the movie, and we just kept adding to it, and we gave it to the writer to listen to, so it was just kind of a... Th Set the tone. Yep. And there was a lot of Mogwai in it. And we realized one day, why don't we just ask Mogwai? So we did, and they get offered really big stuff all the time, he said, and they turn it down, like big Hollywood movies. And they'd never done a movie before, like you said. They'd only done a French TV show and a bunch of docs. Yeah. And we're there on the phone, and they say, yeah, we really emotionally, emotionally connected to your screenplay, and we'd love to do your first movie. And we were just like, oh. And we went on mute. And then it was like, uh, yes, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, they, they, they're cool guys. And we got to go to Glasgow and, and sit in, with the, in the studio with them. And in a sense, like, help produce one of our favorite Mogwai albums, which, like, when does that ever happen? Yeah. And now they're Fucking releasing nice. not only the soundtrack, the, the score soundtrack, but they're going to well, they have uh, taken cues and stretched them out into full-length studio songs. So it's, it's a Mogwai album called, called Kin. Kin. It's yeah. ridiculous. Awesome. And you should pick it up because it's a really solid album. comes yeah. out the day uh, the movie drops, so August 31st. I'm excited to hear that. Um, and then one last question is, uh, so you were mentioned how this has a more you know, family-centric, and I really love that about these newer sci-fi movies like Arrivals or Midnight Special, if you've seen it. Yeah, um, absolutely. Like a looper, even. Yep. Um, Help, any thoughts all on great references. Continuing like exploring that sci-fi, I know you have this TV show that's hopefully going to come out, or yeah. are you into other genres that you have a passion uh, for? Definitely, man. Like John was saying before, we don't like being boxed as directors. It's kind of really limiting. So yeah, we like all kinds of film, and there's so many different references in this, from like E.T. to Mud to all the way up District to, to District 9, to like it's Moonlight meets District 9 in a weird way. There's so many different things going on. And that's just purely because we like a lot of different movies. And, and, and why can't they all be in, why, why can't they all sit in the one film? Well, you tell me, go and see it, and maybe they don't. But we think they do. Uh, so when it comes to the stuff that we want to do in the future, yeah, I think sci-fi is a part of it. But we're also interested in, in other things. I mean, the movie that Damien Chazelle's looking at right now about um, the moon, it's killer, man. We'd love to do something like that. So who knows? Thanks, fellas. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, hi. I'm hey, sure. how are you? Um, hey, what was your name? Paris. Paris. Sound Australian. I'm very Australian. Okay. Um, maybe a little bit more. Maybe than more are. than us. <laughs> maybe more than you guys. I've lived here 17 years, so who knows okay. how I sound? Um, no, well, firstly, I just want to ask you nothing super technical, but I'm I'm really 
very proud to see Australians on stage ever Thank you. doing kick-ass work. Thank you, Shiva. So that's the first thing, and Americans and everybody else, yeah, by yeah. the way. No, no, but we're not talking about them right <laughs> now. <laughs> Between you and I, welcome. Um, no, but I'm just very curious about, you know, the life you had in Australia, and obviously you were involved in this kind of stuff, or at least burgeoning into this stuff yep, when you we were in Australia. Yeah. Um, what kind of different perspective do you think it does give you coming from Australia? And you know, there's a lot of Australians in LA and in yeah, New no, York sure, sure else. there is. It was part of the reason we moved to New York, to be honest. Um, look, we have always felt like we are a little bit of an outsider coming into the industry and coming through advertising as well. We have a different perspective on certain things. Um, certainly, aspects of the film are quite timely as well. Um, and so, yeah, we have we have a unique perspective. I think that's always helped. What do you think? Um, the, in Australia, we worked mostly music video and advertising, um, so we didn't really have a chance to dive into the Australian film industry per se. I think they're doing some super respectful stuff. Um, I think it's small, and I think it's um, there's a ceiling on it in a way. So, so if you want to tell a really big story you've kind of got to bring everything else down to make it work for the money, and that's disappointing. Or limiting. Yeah. It's limiting. Um, so I, I do think a lot of people get up and move, and obviously London and LA are two massive options. I think there's a shit ton of talent coming out of Australia, and, and that's why we have a lot of actors, and maybe Americans don't even know half of them are Australian, but like, there's a lot that are doing really, really good stuff. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think we could have made this movie in Australia, which right. is disappointing in some ways. But then the way we've approached it by putting the two tones together, I think is very Australian. So I don't know. I'm actually really interested in how it goes down there and what the response will be, because we're, we're trying to do some promotion over there. And yeah. hopefully people see it. I'll try and pimp you out if I can. Oh, man, That's do great. it. Pimp but, away. Yeah, but good luck with it. Thank Thanks. you. It Appreciate that. Thanks. What was your name? Oh, Paris. Thank you, Paris. Pleasure. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? What was your name? Uh, Susan. Hey, Susan. Hey. Nice to meet you um, from this far away. Um, my question is about the diversity of the cast and how yep. intentional that may or may not have been and if we can expect to see more of that in your work. Uh, for sure. I mean, again, sort of stepping into America and seeing a lot of the conversation that's happening uh, in one way is super encouraging because things are changing. In another way, uh, it's kind of disappointing that we're even talking about this. And so this is just us playing our part. I mean, it, it's more interesting to us to have a story about a young African-American lead that is finding a MacGuffin from a sci-fi movie, and we just don't see that. I mean, Josh said a while ago, white kids have been finding alien spice, space rifles for far too long. Uh, <laughs> let's mix it up a little bit. So, yeah. so, so it's two things. It, the first is it's just more interesting as a filmmaker, because you, you want to dive into something that feels different and unique. Uh, and on the other side, um, you know, we made a short. We lived in New York, and we set it in Harlem, and and we were definitely going to keep that vibe when we moved over to make the movie. Uh, it's, it's really, really refreshing and really delightful to see the reactions from young black teens when they see this movie. To be honest, and representation is super important, and seeing themselves up on screen and seeing how this character's arc uh, evolves is, is awesome. And we've had some great responses. Thank you. Keep it up. Yeah, appreciate it. One more question here. Awesome. Last one. Hi, guys. I'm Chris. What's up, uh, Chris? I'm curious about, so I spent a couple of years in my 20s attempting to be a screenwriter. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I'm curious that when you guys were trying to make the leap into first feature film, one of the struggles that I had because I was a sci-fi writer was how do you how do you determine like you know the story you want to write how big do you make it based on you know that budget's going to be hard to come by like you want to tell yeah, the story yeah, yeah. the right way but then the more cool scenes you pack in the more dollars start to come That's up. a great Look, question. That, that is a really cool question. Um, I feel like coming from visual effects really helped us with that. We know what things cost and so We've restrained ourselves, that's probably the right word, restricted ourselves when we have told stories for the last 15 years because we know where it gets a little dodgy because you're like, I, don't, I can't afford this. And we don't want to be doing the scene that we can't afford in a really bad way. So this movie is a really good example of that where 
we do some big things in this, and but they're all. Nothing is ridiculous. Nothing gets to the point where you're like, well, wow, they spent like billions of dollars on. I that. mean, and an example is there's not one green screen in this movie. It's all very practical. Uh, props were made, environments were created, sets were built. Uh, we're dealing with a young. 14-year-old actor that's never been in a movie. We had to make it as realistic as we mm. could for him, so that was one reason. But another is just we've always been very responsible directors in a weird way. Uh, I don't know if that's a thing to brag about. It could be not, a bad But thing. coming from advertising, you, you know like what the budget is and you know what you can afford and you know what things cost. So you know, we just don't put ourselves out right. there to fail. But we had a lot of conversations specifically on this movie about how far do we go? And and, and I think this is the anti-giant movie in a way because you're getting all of that stuff still, but we're making you care about it. Um, we're starting slow, and, and we're and we're introducing you to these characters, and the, and it takes a little bit before the gun comes out and gets fired, and and we're like, obviously that's part of tightening the noose and tension and all that stuff, expectation. But then we're also we're never going to that place where you start rolling your eyes and you're like, all right, that just got really silly. And I think that's just done on purpose. We want it to feel real world, and the buzzword is grounded sci-fi, man. So like, keep that shit grounded. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for coming by our office. Real pleasure. Um, Thanks for having us. Visit it, Jonathan Joss's uh, Google page. Go to Google them. Uh, Twin dot work. Um, they also have Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And go check out Ken next week. We're, we're around. Uh, movie drops August 31st in IMAX. Can't believe we got an IMAX release. Yeah, just, uh, just lastly, the, the, the IMAX and DTSX, one of the best surround sound uh, audio in the world. It's crazy that you put out a trailer and people like the trailer, and then suddenly we've got IMAX saying, we'd love to put you guys on for a week. And so now we have IMAX. And then DTSX knocked on the door and said, this looks really cool. We'd love to give you a full surround, like the best sound in the world. So it's one of those amazing things. You make something cool and people come knocking. So. Take their word for it. Go check it out. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. That was fun.